All right, guys, this is your fair warning. A lot of people like to come in and get really offended by videos that I make. Um, my intention is not to offend anybody, so uh, feel free to click away, watch something else. If you want to stick around and learn something, you'll see somebody try to put meals together from wild sources, and some of that includes eating animals. If you're a grocery store hunter, and you insist that I, or insist that you and other people shop at the grocery store and don't catch wild food, this isn't the channel for you. So carry on as I will. First snowshoe ever, guys. I've finally broken the curse. I've finally figured out how to do it. If you guys want to learn how I did this, keep watching. Well, this isn't such a bad haul. Let's clean these guys up and turn them into a meal. Let's see, we got ourselves a hair back here. Just a little bit of practice goes a long way, guys. That's a fact, two for two, guys. Two snares, two traps. Kidneys, heart, and torso. That's your lie down spot? That looks like a death trap. Ah, I'm stuck. So there you go. Two kidneys and a heart on a skewer. It's a kebab. A kebab. No booze, all yays? <laughs> yeah, and leave your yay right now. Thumbs up. There you go. Hey guys, just like uh, take a moment out of the main feature of this video to talk to you about something I've added, something that should be fun. So I'm offering a prize if you can spot it. What, uh, what it's called is an Easter egg. So it's something that I've added to the video, something extra, something odd, something that, that does not belong. And uh, when you spot it, you'll definitely know. So I'm not gonna give you too many hints, but I'm gonna tell you that you should use your hunter eye. Um, if you do manage to spot it, what you're gonna do is drop it down in the comment section and uh, put up the timestamp of the video in which it appears. So you can just say what it is and what time it appears. The first person that does that will win the prize. The prize is a Boreal uh, Tripper Kit. Uh, you've seen my um, fold up saw by uh, Boreal 21. Uh, don't mind the city noises here. And uh, they've offered up a saw that values $104, US. It'll come with a saw, the sh uh, a sheath to carry it, and then an extra aggressive uh, rancher blade. So it's very similar to the saw I have, if not the exact saw, I'm not 100% sure. So it's that fold-out saw. You'll see me use it in this video as well. It's a really great saw and you'll really enjoy it. So um, obviously not everybody can win. There's only gonna be one winner. This is gonna be merit-based. This is gonna be the uh, person who uses the most skill, pays the most attention to this very long video to find it. So I will tell you, it's not in a spot the hare hunt. It's not spotting the hare. It's something completely different from that. And when it when you see it, you'll it'll hit you right in the face because you'll notice right away. Um, I'd also like to say thank you very much for your support. Uh, we ran a, a little experiment on the last video. We had you do what's what called watch time, and, and uh, YouTube loves it when videos get watched a very very long time. So watch time counts. So if you guys watch this whole video or put it on auto repeat and watch it three times, even if you're not sitting there watching it, it makes that video skyrocket and it puts it in front of people, other people who might not ordinarily see it. It gets that, get put down in the recommended video section. So not only do people in, in our little small community see it, but other people who watch similar videos. So please continue to do that for me. That really helps keep this channel alive. Uh, leave multiple comments. If you leave one long comment, YouTube counts one. If you leave a bunch of little comments, YouTube counts a bunch of little comments. The more the comments, the better. Hit the like button, it always helps. It takes two seconds, it really does help. Share the video. I know you guys don't like to share and spam your friends, but it does help and YouTube tracks all this stuff. Add it to a playlist. So you can click it down to watch later. You can make a separate place, add the video to it. YouTube tracks all these things and it helps the video. And the next thing is the, fir the first 48 hours of the video upon launch really matters. And YouTube decides if it's a good video or not based on the metrics it gets. Watch time, like I said, multiple comments, uh, hitting like, sharing, adding to a playlist. It tracks all these things. So guys, keep it up. Share with your friends and put it on auto replay and let it watch the whole video. You don't have to sit there and watch it, guys. But, you know, obviously I would like you to. It tells me that the video is good. But just letting it play on auto repeat three or four times bumps up that watch time. 
hugely and then YouTube thinks it's a great video and recommends it to other people. All right, without further ado, on to the video. So as you know, I've been having some difficulty trapping some snowshoe hair. So I'm not the type of person that's gonna give up very easily. We've got the ideal conditions. It's super cold up here in the north. Minus uh, 27 degrees uh, Celsius. You'll have to look that up in Fahrenheit, but it's cold. It's about as cold as it gets uh, for December conditions. We've got some snowshoe hair tracks kind of coming through here. I'm gonna set up a bunch of snares and see how I do. So I don't believe I'm super qualified to teach you how to snare hair, but I can teach you what I know about snaring hairs and not that much, but it's enough to get this for a meal. All I do is I grab a length of wire. The wire is as stipulated in your local regulations. You'll have to look that up. Uh, here it's, I believe, gauge 20 to 24. So I'm gonna do is make a little loop little J and then I'm gonna twist it together I mean I leave a little tail here because I don't have pliers which would be nice I just have the side cutters so the tail is gonna give me something to brace my thumb against while I twist and you want that eyelet to be fairly small I can only get it about that big and then I'll crush it down a little bit I think if you get it tighter it won't come back on itself. So once the animal gets inside the snare, it's permanently inside. And then I'm gonna make a loop, being careful not to make the loop, uh, make any indents in the loop. I'm gonna pull that tight. And I don't know if it's the right way to do this or not, but I'm gonna preload it because I find it wants to kind of go back on itself if you don't. But now it wants to come in on itself, which is what you want it to do. You want it to tighten. So when it comes back, it wants to go forward, which is what you want. So if you load it all the way out, bring it back, and then kind of round it up, you've got yourself a pretty simple snare. And that's about all you need. When the animal goes through, it struggles and fights against it, and it pulls tight. And animals don't like to back up, but once it gets past you can see how my hand is pretty much like the head of a of a uh, hair. It's got bones at the back here. Once it tries to go backwards, it can't. So once it gets to a certain level, and uh, I've I've put up trail camera images before of snowshoe hair, and they can smell this stuff. They smell the wires and they try to avoid it. So the trick is to get it into a place where. Um, they want to go through no matter what. So you don't want to bush it in too much. You want to make it look like it's fairly inviting and you want to use an existing rabbit trail, a hair trail in this case. You don't want to step on the trail ever because they'll stop using it. They don't like to go in these little divots. <coughs> they like to use their main runs. So you find a run. Uh, this snow is not very deep, but once it gets deeper, then the hares will start to use really specific trails and you want to key in on those spots. And you want to put it in a wide open area but you want to put it in areas where they're having to go through thick brush. So as you can see, I don't know, I'll show you uh, here. The rabbit was going under a, an overhanging branch. It went through a little area here. And uh, on the sides, I'll brush that in a little bit, put some sticks, so I'll try to guide it to go in the middle. And then just that below the snare, I'm gonna put a little chin up stick. And that's just to guide the hair. It's not very much, just, just enough just to keep the uh, hair's chin up so that it guides it through the loop. So you don't want the hair to go underneath or left or right. So you got sticks on both sides, a stick on the bottom here, just a little twig, and that'll guide the hair, hair in, uh, head in. So four inches is the maximum here that we can use. Um, but you know, a fox can push its head in there too. Just as simple as that. All it has to do is widen up a little bit as it's pushing through and their heads are designed to do that. So let's get going on this snare. Okay guys. We get to do the spot the hair challenge like we did last year with the hair hunt. This time I didn't have my gun with me so I wasn't able to shoot this hair. I was just out setting some snares. I did bump a hair. It ran off a little bit and, and um, relied on its camouflage as they do. So your job is to spot it. Now they aren't easy to spot. What we look, look for is the eye. So you got to get your hunter eye out and you got to look for the hare's eye. They are camo and white. 
and they use their camo to hide themselves. So right now the hair is in frame and you should be able to spot it. What we're going to do is progressively move in. So you figure out when you can see that hair, you look very carefully. You should be able to spot it now. If you, if you don't and you can't, you need to get better at hunting, my friend. So as we move in now, it should be pretty obvious where that hair is. You should be able to spot it by now. We're going to move in until you do. So now, if you can't spot it, you need to sharpen your hunter skills. So there it is. There's that little black eye that we look for. The black tips on the ears. Now we've zoomed in quite a bit, so I'm going to reset the frame and I'm going to show just how camouflaged this hair is. So if you're not spotting and you're not looking for hair, you're not going to see it and you can see how it disappears So if I move the angle. So watch carefully. You know, you would not see that hair unless you were looking for it. And that's what those hairs rely on. They're camouflage. So you can see as I approach it takes off. Now I want you to see as we back up the frame here from where it was sitting. And this is only a few yards guys. You can see how that hair very, very, very quickly disappears into its surroundings. Gone. So if you're out hunting hair, you have to have a very keen eye. So as you can see, this little set here failed. Uh, it didn't look like anything went through there. But if we follow the tracks over this way, we see that we've got ourselves a nice little hair over here. So that's going to be my first snowshoe hair. Yay me! Good neck catch, just behind the head. You guys always pick up your trash, even these little wires here, they'll last forever in the woods. Keep them back in with you, there's no reason to leave them out here. Well, this set was a big old fail because I actually have fresh, really fresh tracks going through. You see the chin up bar is missing on that one. There's fresh tracks all the way through and uh, both sides it actually went through what looks like the snare or it went around it. At least it bumped it because no chin up bar. Fresh tracks, even this morning fresh tracks. Both sides of it. It didn't go around, it actually went through the snare. So this snare's actually fell down it's too wobbly and the chin-up bar is gone too so it pushed that out of the way oh well they don't always work so we've got another run here another fresh set of tracks down here we've got some fresh droppings and no hair and it looks like the hair actually went up to the set here and stopped and made a turn here and went around and then continued on the path that it wanted to go on anyway. So this one got completely bypassed. You can see it probably sniffed the snare, sniffed the chin up bar thing and then decided, well, what's the point in going through that, which smells weird when I can just go around the other side. So that wasn't a good setup. It's too open here. I I did another run here. There's another run right through here, you can see. And I got myself a hair. Right back in here. All I did for this set, I actually set the snare over on this side here. This this tree branch wasn't there. But I wired it up on the cedar here. And uh I squared it up over here on that side. And you can see that the hair is down here. So this run basically went from under this log here across to the other side. And because it didn't have a good anchor point, I didn't want to anchor to the top here. I found a branch and I stuck that down to the ground here. And then I wired this to the log. And the snare loop was actually over on this side, which made a perfectly good funnel with all these raspberry bushes. And you can see, we got ourselves a hair back here. There we 
go. The hair back here, good set. Perfect behind the neck catch. Beauty. So here we are guys, another hair. So there we go guys, I'm getting much, much, much better at snaring hair. Just a little bit of practice goes a long way guys. If you're just learning, all you do is trial and error. If you screw up the first time, all you have to do is uh, go back, watch some videos on the internet and uh, put those experts that you can find around you into practice. And you can be catching hairs like this too in no time. This is only really my third try at doing it. So I've picked this skill up pretty quickly. It's a pretty simple thing once you understand the key things about loop size, positioning, and then finding those trails too, not stepping on them, and then making sure that you block the path, but not too much. So I've been setting V-shaped sticks in front with a chin-up bar, a chin-up stick just below, and that seems to be doing the trick. It's making all the difference in the world for me. So this is a far more efficient way of collecting meat than hunting. You can set these snares in about an hour or two and you can have all these little tools working for you. And a, a roll of this wire you can get at the, we sell at the hardware store here. Uh, we also have at some outdoor supply stores. It's about 20 bucks for, you know, several hundred meters of the stuff. And it goes a long way. And you can set a lot of, a lot of snares on a, a few hundred meters or 50 meters of wire. So here, another, another chunk of meat for the pot, as they say. You catch it, you clean it, you cook it, and you eat it. That's the rule. Whatever you catch, you eat. Oh. <laughs> this is an interesting set. I worked really hard on this one. It's actually a blow down of trees forming a canopy up above me. And I had to crawl up because the trail ran underneath this uh, cedar here. And it's very, very covered, so the hair are probably coming up here for safety uh, from predators. But there was a, a pathway they were following. The only issue is underneath this log, they can come under anywhere they want. Um, they weren't going up here so much, but over in this area here, where you can see I have these sticks laid up across, forming a bit of a fence line. And what was that was doing was it wasn't completely blocked off here. I mean, they could still go through this spot if they wanted to, but I wanted them to go through my snare. I guess my head's blocking it, but there's another hair here. There we go, we got another hair. They're so well camouflaged, you probably can't even see that. I'll get this guy untied and I'll show you the, a little bit more of a setup and where I am. So this one, I used this log here, and I made the loop in that position there. You can see, my hair knocked a lot of the sticks I had put up over here. Oh, the sticks were just locked up like that across here, and then the opening where the trail was going is right here. So there we go. I've checked two sets, two sets now only. These are my brand new two sets. I moved up the way a little bit from where I was before, and uh, I'm two for two, believe it or not. That's a fact, two for two, guys. <laughs> two snares, two traps, two successes. I have to go back and check my other ones, but uh, that's a pretty good haul, three hair just from this area here. So you could see the, they were going under the log here, and they would go up underneath all this stuff over here. You can see there's lots of cover, so, this, the uh, snare set was here off of this branch that's connected still to the, the cedar and then I had to block off this area here so they wouldn't want to go the easiest route away from everything and you can see over here is all open so I wanted them to go through this space here not just bypass it so all these logs were set up just like that with v-shaped logs all these little sticks here, I had propped them all up, forming a little bit of a fence line, just to give them the obvious spot was there. And then I would loop out here, connect it to this branch, loop there. Simple. You see the tangle of logs in here. 
all the way up and the rabbits would come from that direction over there the other set I just checked was actually over there under that log so I caught these rabbit and these hair just about 20 feet apart one over there under that set and then the trail would come up over here and go there so obviously a different rabbit came from a different way well I gotta say snaring hair is much more effective than hunting them so now let's turn these guys into a meal. To process this hair, all I'm going to do is I'm going to cut to the backbone here and I'm going to pull left and right and just skin it out. <clears throat> I'm not going to hang it. I'm just going to do like the quick and dirty method. I'm just making a little slit in the back there. I'm actually going to put some gloves on because I don't want to put my mitts back on after I'm done cleaning this with gross hands. Hopefully this guy's defrosted enough so all I've done is split the back there yeah. hairs fur is quite thin so this job's pretty easy I'm just pulling toward the back toward the back hind legs all the way down Still a little bit frozen. Front arms out. One arm and the other arm. Cut the feet off here. I'm not going to keep the head this time. So we're just going to cut that off. There we go. So, unlike the Jeremy method, my guy's gonna be full of hair because I don't do it very carefully and that's exactly why I get Jeremy to teach you how to do it. So now we gotta take the guts out. So if you guys are gonna complain about this being graphic, stop right now. This is exactly what you would get, more or less, aside from the guts still being in there, in the grocery store. And I've seen a rabbit in the grocery store exactly like this. So save it guys. So at this point, you know, we've got the, co the covering casings off. So most, most animals are the same like this. Deer is exactly the same. Basically, all you do is peel that off. There's no joint in the front end. And the same with the other side. You can see all you do is cut, pull, cut through there. And uh, I'm not gonna gut it just yet because what I'm gonna do is separate the haunches here. So all I have to do is find that joint, the hip joint here, and work around the ball. And there's our one of our rear quarters. And the same on the other side here. So it's just a matter of not dulling your knife on the bone here, but finding, there's the ball there, and there'll be some ligaments connecting it all you have to do is get those and it's going to be free here just going to get it off the pelvis without cutting too much of the meat away because you want it to be all one piece if you can there we go so there we have two quarters four quarters all we have left is torso all the guts inside. This I'm not going to show because as a culture and as a society we're not allowed to see the guts anymore. We are only allowed to see prepared meat in this form. So I'm going to turn the camera off. I'm All I'm going to do is cut from here up into the heart and lungs area and the liver. We're going to keep that. Uh, there's a diaphragm here and below the diaphragm or above the diaphragm is the lungs below the diaphragm is the guts and what we're going to do is we're going to quarter that up after we're going to take the front quarter in the rib cage and then we'll have the back quarter there'll be some meat on the, the tenderloins at the back or back straps here and that's all that's it that's all we got and after that we're gonna turn it into a proper meal food okay so camera off for now and we'll pick back up
Look at that piece of meat. Beauty. A fantastic piece of meat. Man, that water's freezing. Kidneys, heart, and torso. Love the saw. It's packable. Foldable. Look at that. Beauty saw. Agawa Canyon. Agawa. I'm never gonna say that right. Agawa Canyon, Boreal 21. It's got a great blade, cuts well. Can't ask for any more than that. You made a good spot to lie down? Cool. That's your lie down spot? That looks like a death trap. Ah, I'm stuck. <laughs> yeah. That's your lie down spot? Yeah. Show me. <laughs> that, that looks really comfy. I don't have to push or else you won't stay up. Yeah, show me how you wipe out. We are going to do something very interesting. What do you think we're gonna do, buddy? We have a hair heart. And two kidneys. And two kidneys. And we are going to cook them on the fire and eat them. Like a marshmallow, except it's... Most people would say you. Most people would say you. One kidney, two kidneys. See the heart and the kidney. Another kidney. So there you go. Two kidneys and a heart on a skewer. It's a kebab. A kebab. Good word, buddy. Here you go. Here's your kebab. <laughs> so you cook those up, bud. That's a nice warm fire, eh, buddy? So you want that. See how it's turning? You want it just kind of like that, right about there. So like just leave it? Well, I don't know if it would leave it, but yeah, that's a good spot to leave it. So when you're cooking, if you want to know if your meat's going to cook, you take your hand and you hold it over the fire. And if you can't keep it longer than five seconds, that's just the right height. So go. 
One, two, three, four, five. See if you can keep it for longer than that. One, two, three, four, hot. So that means meat's cooking. That's the, the right height for meat to cook. And we'll just turn it around every once in a while. Here we go. There's our hearts, kidneys. Take the love off. Okay, I'm gonna do kidney at the same time. Kidney, cheers. Hair kidney. Good. I'll have half the heart. Yeah. Okay, so the heart. It's just a piece of meat. Chewy piece of meat. It's very good though. Yeah. Just put the whole thing in there and chew. So it's I think good. Good hair heart? No. Yeah. yeah? I think it's good. Can't wait for this though. That's gonna be really good. I want it right now. <laughs> You're gonna have to wait in two hours. You're gonna have to wait a while, that's for sure. You excited? Yeah. Okay, so this has been on the fire, on the coals for about two hours. Uh, a couple things I want to go over. So, uh, Alejandro in the comment section said that we should call the adobo spice, not adobo, but? Woodobo. Woodobo, how about that? So from now on, we're going to call the spice woodobo. And uh, Holy and I made some today, just special. You can get the, most of these ingredients from your bulk store. Just go over this real quick. So, because everybody asks, how do you make the wadobo spice? So it's two tablespoons of salt, one tablespoon of paprika, two tea, uh, teaspoons of pepper, one and a half teaspoons of onion powder, one and a half teaspoons of oregano, one and a half teaspoons of cumin, one teaspoon of garlic powder, and one teaspoon of chili powder. That's it, okay? The chili powder is optional. I don't put it in because I don't like spicy food. Uh, and you obviously can double and triple that recipe so you have stuff on hand. So that's the wadobo spice. I'll put the ingredients down in the comment section so you guys can make your own. Okay, next thing, uh, I did ask you guys, I polled you guys like, you know, for some ideas on how to cook the hair. And uh, a lot of you guys provided really good recipes that I would love to do, but I wanted to do this simple enough and I wanted to do it in such a way that I could do it over the fire. The person that came up with this recipe or variation of the recipe was the-, the Northern close good memory buddy the North Shore so what I did for this uh, recipe was I took the hair I dried it off and then covered it in oil and seared it remember I seared it and that was still in the moisture and then next thing I did was uh, dropped a bunch of oil on the bottom covered it in aluminum foil and then we added what potato uh, carrot carrot one more a butter butter onion a wadobo. and wadobo yeah and then we covered it all up Throw it on the coals after the fire had burnt right down. And uh, that's it. Now it's ready to go. So we need some cutlery. I'll use my Groman folding knife to make us some cutlery. So here, my friend, is your fork. Yeah. Okay, I'll make my fork. You can go ahead and open that, bud. Let's have a look and see how it turned out. Whoa. I'm I'm not totally expecting that we are going to have fall off the bone meat because if you've ever cooked outdoors you know that it's ridiculously difficult to slow cook anything outdoors. Oh, it's pretty good. Pretty good? You think we should get a close up of that? Check out that hunk of meat. A Make pig sure it doesn't fall. Hunk of meat on a stick. Okay, that's your hunk of meat. That can be your plate here. It's got the lid. Ready? Sure. You gonna try a potato first or what? I'm gonna do a carrot. I'm gonna be hot. I might have to use a knife. Cause like I said, I don't think it's gonna be fall off the bone, but one day I'll get there. Yeah. Ow. If it's not hot, you can probably grab it with your, uh, with your hand there, bud. Oh, it's not too bad though. 
It was like the heart. The heart was chewy like this. Yeah, that hunk of meat. Yeah, chewy. Yeah, I know. Mm, it's good. I like it. It's good? Mm. Yeah, it is good. It's a tiny bit chewy. A tiny bit chewy, but totally tolerable. But that's good. That's really good. Big hunk of meat. You can't really taste the wadobo. No, not, re not really, eh? It seems like the wadobo kind of cooked off a little bit, but that's really good meat. Yeah. Yeah. So, just because I didn't take your recipe does not mean it wasn't a good recipe. I just wanted something that I could easily make in the woods that didn't require too many ingredients like, you know, like cans of mushroom soup and the stuff I can't really eat anyway because it has milk and cream. So I just wanted something simple. My onion is actually really good with the wadobo spice. You should try this part. Like this part, it's really good. Why is it's that part bitter. good? Mm -hmm. I, like the brown part. Oh, the seared part's really good, Holden says. Yeah, try it. You know what? This is all really good. It's really warm, too. Yeah. That's good because I'm kind of cold. You're cold, me too. Yeah, once that fire goes out, it's cold, guys. It's like minus 20. Um, Celsius. Yeah. The sun don't move down. That's the rest of the day, guys. Probably. Most of our day here. You guys don't, I don't think a lot of people who cook outdoors don't really realize how long it takes, but to put this kind of meal together, I mean, not only pursuing the animal, cleaning it, uh, you know, brining it, but making the fire, it's, it's probably two or three days worth of labor when you add everything together. It's not a small, it's not a small operation. You can imagine that our, anybody who actually tried to live off the land you know, probably never stop working. They would have worked all the time. Ow. Can you help? Whoa, no, it's stuck in your teeth. <laughs> Ow. Is that a piece of bone? I think so. You piece of bone. A real carnivore. I would recommend that you try, try to do stuff like this. Well, kids are asking now what they, what I recommend that they do. Um, start off by fishing, guys and work your way up to hunting because hunting is a whole new ball game, especially when you start processing mammalian animals. Look, I bit so far. Nice. That's good meat though, do you like it? Yeah. yeah. And um, there's a book called Chicouterie. I would recommend you guys read that. There's something about brining meat that helps it make, helps it more tender and helps it pick up a lot of the flavors. So combining, you know, the searing, and the salting really helps break down the protein fibers and then it helps um, moisturize the fibers and it keeps the moisture inside can the meat. In? You can. Is that all you can get off there? No, but I want to try the rib. You want to try the rib? Well, the ribs, the rib cage actually, you can probably take some of the, um, we call it the bacon. No, I want the bacon. Bacon? Sure. Bacon. I'll see if I can get you a piece off it. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned a little bit on the, on how to snare hair. I learned a lot just through trial and error. I watched quite a few people's YouTube channels on how to do it. And uh, like I said, I just went out there and did it. And I didn't know a thing about snaring last year. So this is all new to me and I've been able to master it basically like three times out, master it. I haven't mastered it yet, but I've been able to uh, put food on the table, managed to get a bunch this year. So I'd say that's a pretty successful um, learning curve. So we're gonna finish this up. Yeah, because when we went on vacation, you caught like, what, four rabbits, three? Yeah. Three rabbits? Three, yeah. And uh, a fourth one I got, I shot. So I got, I got four total. But, but somehow he caught a fox in the snare. That's true. That's a spoiler for the next one. The fox one's gonna be an interesting one. I'm working on that one I'm too. I'm getting the tail. You're gonna get the tail, huh? Anyway, good, good enough? Yeah? Yeah, you I want to see my anything? dinner. You wanna see anything else? Good dinner? No booze. No booze?
Right. Oh no, booze. Meaning no, no thumbs down, all thumbs up, guys. Just like the muskrat video. You guys did a really good job on that. You gave us lots of thumbs up. So thanks for that. All right, cheers. That's it. We're out. Hope you enjoyed it. Get out there and do it yourself. No booze, all yays? Yeah, and leave your yay right now. Thumbs up. <laughs> there you go. Bye bye. Bye bye. Men have boxes in their brain. They have a box for hunting, they have a box for nurturing, they have a box for sports, they have a box for fishing, they have a box for their family, they have a box for their children. Those are all separate little boxes inside their head and they don't touch each other. So if you show a masculine man this, they might have a visceral reaction right away and then they stick it into a box and it's fine there. They don't have to mesh it around and say, are you going to kill and eat your children? Are you going to kill and eat your family? Well, what's next? That's not a masculine reaction to seeing a cute animal. That's a feminine reaction. And we have feminized their boys in the recent times so they can't compartmentalize, compartmentalize things very well. And they haven't done the exercise of compartmentalizing this thing, a living to a dead to food because they don't have to do that mental exercise. They can do it in video games and they can stick those in a box. And of course, uh, you know, there's a transition, there's, there's a gradient uh, from all the way through men and women can do the same sorts of things. And we have 7 billion people on the planet. So I'm not saying women can't do this. I'm just saying they don't do it on average as well as men. So men can put things in a box. So when we're cleaning a hair, what we're doing is we're sticking it in a certain spot in our minds and they don't touch any other spot. And this is exactly what uh, nature had intended for men to do, to provide for their families. Because if, if, men, if men couldn't do this dirty work, if men couldn't turn this into food, our ancestors would have starved. And hunting is a relatively new, or anti-hunting, I should say, is a relatively new phenomenon. It's only happened in the last hundred years. Every single one of your ancestors hunted. I mean, this agricultural revolution is a new thing and relying on it is very new. So I want you to think about those things as you move forward and I want you to, to exercise some of these things that think about uh, what it is that you are designed to do and what your evolution has programmed you to do and uh, don't be apologetic about it and, re and recognize it. So I want you to think about the fact that women are primarily emotional thinkers. Almost everything they do is filtered through an emotional screen and if it passes through that emotional screen, then it passes the test. Men, on the other hand, use logic and reason as their screen. They do use emotion also, but the primary reason, the primary objective of men is to make things make sense and to operate in a real physical world rather than an emotional feelings-based world. So while my wife would have, have a hard time with this hair, she wouldn't have a hard time with the meal it provides to her children. But it's getting past the hurdle, which is this, this casing. That's the problem because this animal looks like it's worthy of care. It looks cute and cuddly. So I understand guys where you're coming from. And an interesting story to end this chat, I, I had to uh, defrost these in the house, obviously, because it's uh, you know below zero out here. Um, but we do have an innate response to, uh, innate visceral response to seeing animal hair. Uh, so I get where you're coming from. Uh, it didn't really occur to me right away. I mean, because I've kind of grown up doing this and so I've gone through this process a long time ago, but some, to some of you who might not have, you know, I, I can see that you're struggling with it right now, even seeing it uh, through a screen. But let me tell you, so I initially had put them on the kitchen floor, you know, on newspaper to let them defrost and, uh, you know, go about the day and you forget about them. So when you turn the corner and you see them, you jump. I mean, you don't jump and scream because, you know, that's a feminine response, but you jump. You're like, well, there's an animal. And then you immediately go into fight or flight or hunter mode, right? If you're, if you're hunting, you're like, well, hunter right away. That's a hairy animal. Um, and it's the hairy animal factor that gets you. So later on when they had defrosted, I put them in the fridge 
And again, you know, as the mind goes, you're not, you're not accustomed to seeing a furry animal in the fridge, open the door, jump again. Jeez. And it took me about five or six or seven tries before I opened the fridge. Okay, well, when I open the fridge, I'm expecting to see a furry dead animal in the fridge. So when my wife came upstairs, I made sure to mention that, you know, they were on the kitchen floor. And my wife did the same thing about three or four times in the fridge to the point where she refused to go in the fridge. Um, not exactly, but I mean, you get the idea. So she was, she was like prepared to dish that responsibility off to me. And so did my son for that matter, because my son's eight and he does have some outdoor, outdoor experience, but he doesn't have a ton. And so for him, you know, it's all new to him. So he has to get through the hurdle and he, he and he's very sensitive. He's a very sensitive kid. And, uh, I don't know if that's because he's not, wasn't exposed to it early on, but I, neither was I, I mean, I picked, I picked up hunting because uh, when I turned 20, I think I mentioned this before, I, I decided I was a hunter. You know, it's, it was innate inside me. And, uh, you know, people have problems with that, with this, because, you know, the 5% of the population hunts, not exposed to it anymore. But you probably, if you're watching this, you probably have the genes to be a hunter. And so you need to think about that. Uh, you need to think about if, the, if it's something you're going to actually use in your life or not. And to me, it was something that I needed to do when I turned, you know, my early 20s. I decided... This is the time I need to hunt. I said, I said to myself, I want to go, I want to start bow hunting. I want to take a deer and I had to start from scratch, not knowing anything at all. So it was just like something that compelled me to do it. Just like uh, a wolf is compelled to hunt or a fox is compel compelled to hunt. These are predators that are compelled to hunt and so are we as humans. You know, a large part of our DNA is held in hunting, in hunting, which is why, you know, I make these wild edible videos and nobody watches them. You don't get that visceral hunter response from seeing, you know, a wild edible. And yeah, okay, it's, it's, you know, we did eat a lot of wild edibles too, but it doesn't incite that primal instinct of a hunter that drives people to click on something. So people are clicking on the bear hunt and they're being, becoming offended by it. And the beaver, they're becoming offended by that. And the hare, you know, they they just they 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 get offended by it because they don't know what it means to them anymore, but it does mean something, which is why you're clicking on it. So anyway, there's lots of thoughts I want you guys to think about. I haven't even started cleaning this hair yet, uh, such as how things go. So anyway, I'm going to clean this up and we're going to cook it. Comes up to this, comes up to the snare. What? What? No. Oh. It totally karate chopped that thing out of the way. Let's watch this up close. Look at that. Whack. Just pushes it over and then pops its head up in celebration. That hair defeated us. 